Hello everyone, welcome back to our channel. Bex here today to share with you my entire nonfiction TBR. I have 41 books currently stacked on the floor here in front of me, and I've been itching to do a TBR bookshelf video, so I decided to split it up between fiction and nonfiction, so I'm starting with nonfiction, clearly. And I just wanted to go through each of the books that I have, try to say a little bit about it. I'm gonna try not to go on forever and ever, but share what I have, a little bit about it, and then if you've read the book, let me know what you thought of it. If you're also excited about reading the book, we can just share our thoughts on all of these books that I really do hope to read at some point, and I'll probably mention like which books I've had on my TBR for a long time. Uh, my TBR bookshelf is the one that you usually see in videos right here. You can just barely see the edge of it right there. So that's usually what you see on the side. So that thing is pretty much completely full uh, between the fiction and nonfiction, uh, and then all of my red books over here which you never see in videos just the angle that I typically choose to shoot at so if uh, you don't have a beverage already if you don't have a snack already I would recommend it uh, yeah I've got my uh, drink here non-alcoholic it's a bubbly peach one yeah. so this is going to keep me hydrated during what I imagine will be a long filming session the first book of all of these, at the very top of the stack, is the only one that I have actually read before. It is Night by Ellie Weisel. I actually read this in my sophomore year of high school, and it was one of those guided reading things, I feel like. They gave us time during class to read a book, and they gave us different options, and I feel like this was an option, and so I chose it. And I read it, therefore, when I was either 15 or 16 depending on what time of the year it was and then I saw it at uh, Value Village I think and I was like I could read that book again. It's very small. It's a Holocaust memoir. It won the Nobel Peace Prize. There's a lot of people that are aware of this book. I'm sure many of you have read it before so this is just one that I feel like it's time for me to reread it and it's a book that deserves to be on my shelves. I then have The Glass Castle by Jeanette Walls. This was made into a film a couple of years ago, and I think I picked this up after the film came out. It was, once again, at a thrift store. That's where I get a lot of my books. And I was like, yeah, I should, I should really read that and then watch the movie. Uh, Jeanette is reflecting on a very tumultuous life that she grew up in, just based on her parents and their decisions and mindset when she was young, and sort of reflecting back on that as an adult. This third book might be the oldest book on this TBR pile. I got this at Borders, I'm pretty sure. Les will recognize this book. Uh, this is British Kings and Queens by Mike Ashley. Oh, technically a brief history of British Kings and Queens. And uh, this is British royal history from Alfred the Great to the present. And it's just one of those things that I really would like to go through at some point. I feel like a lot of people go through a royal phase at some point where you're just like learning about kings and queens. And I read the Royal Diaries middle grade series when I was younger, and I have started to reread that again. And it has piqued my interest in actually picking this up, especially when uh, Queen Elizabeth passed. I was like, oh man, I still have that book. I should actually read it and like learn about the really like in-depth nitty gritty stuff of the British monarchy. This book does end with Queen Elizabeth still on the throne, of course, but there'll be a lot of background history that I think will be hopefully interesting in here. It's just one of those books that it's pretty big and I just haven't just haven't like sat down to do it, but yeah, this may be the oldest one on this pile. I then have The Secret Lives of Color by Cassius St. Clair. This is a very beautiful book where all of the pages are different colors, and it's just an in-depth look at all these different shades of color. It's also got some info at the beginning about like color vision, how, how humans see color, kind of building the palette, giving you all this information, and then it gets into the stories behind these different shades of colors. So it's, it's a bit niche, you know? It's a bit of a very specific thing, but the amount of times I've seen this book and just really wanted a copy, I'm so glad I have it now, but it would be one of those ones I could pick up and put down pretty easily, and it just looks so nice on my shelves. We're gonna really veer into a different direction here with A Knock on the Door, The Essential History of Residential Schools from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. 
this is edited and abridged from the full report that I believe was put together by the commission. And it's got a foreword by a man named Phil Fontaine who was a survivor, or is a survivor of a residential school, I believe he's still alive. But this is published by the University of Manitoba Press. This is very clearly an academic book, one of those random thrift store finds again. Uh, but I feel like this is something that I really do want to learn even more about, like I have a kind of baseline knowledge of what happened, especially as somebody who didn't grow up in Canada, like learning about it after getting here, I feel like I have a pretty decent baseline knowledge. So I feel like this would just kind of elevate it up to the next level. We then have another book that has been on this TBR pile for quite some time. It is a historical tour of Walt Disney World. This is Unauthorized and Unofficial by Andrew Kist. I think a lot of people, when they picked up this book, they thought it was gonna be a history about like Disney and cr the creation of the rides and, and that sort of thing. Whereas this is actually a breakdown of the different rides and the history that influenced them. What is the Jungle Cruise based in? What is the uh, Country Bear Jamboree based in? I guess it's going to talk about like country music and stuff because <laughs> uh, they're bears. Like bears don't actually do what the country bears do. Uh, stuff about Tomorrowland and maybe how they were looking at the future back in the time of, you know, when they were building Disneyland in the 50s. But this is focus on Walt Disney World, but Disneyland and Disney World share some rides. And so there's been a couple times where I've almost picked up this book. I even brought it with me on a trip at one point and I just didn't get to it. It was sort of the lowest one on my stack. There is still an interest there though. I do still want to check it out even though the, the reviews aren't good because most people didn't really understand what to expect when picking this up. We're now going back to Indigenous history in Canada with From the Ashes, My Story of Being Métis, Homeless and Finding My Way by Jesse Thistle. This is a memoir. I know they went on a really bad spiral at one point and drugs, alcohol, and they decided to pull themselves out. They hit their rock bottom, pulled themselves out, and eventually wrote this, this book, which has got a lot of acclaim. I've seen people outside of Canada talk about it as well, so I'm really curious to check this one out. This one's been on the pile for a fair amount of time. It's not one of the oldest ones, but I've looked at it many times on the shelves, and that's Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil by John Brent. This is one of those books where I thought it was fiction for a really long time. Uh, then I found out it's actually true crime nonfiction, and so that made me more interested in it, and it uh, is, I don't even remember what it's about, but obviously you've got like this sort of southern gothic vibe going on. And this book is also very weirdly shaped. It's rather skinny and tall. It's just weird. I, I don't know. I think I probably got this at a book sale or something. I definitely didn't pay full price for it, but yeah, it's, I've seen it kind of floating around every so often on booktube, and there's, there's still like some curiosity there. I just don't know how I feel about this book. Beyond Belfast, a 560 mile walk across Northern Ireland on sore feet by Will Ferguson. This is another one that I've had for a really long time. And there's been a few times where I've almost picked it up and I just wasn't in the mood for it in the moment. Re I've read the first like page of this multiple times. I've looked at the map in it and I just, I've never committed to it, but I do enjoy stories of people going on long journeys, whether on foot or horseback, train ride, whatever. I just, yeah, I do find those interesting and I do really like hiking and he, he calls it a walk, but I, there is something in this that still calls to me, even though it has been sitting on my shelves for so long. More travel stuff. We've got the Condé Nast Traveler Book of Unforgettable Journeys, Bright Writers on Great Places. This is uh, edited by somebody at Condé Nast, I presume. Uh, they partnered with Penguin to put this book out. Oh yeah, edited with an introduction by Clara Glauziuska. Glauziuska? Apologies, I probably mispronounced that. This is just a bunch of different writers talking about many different places. Uh, Japan, the Everglades, Philippines, Provence, Iceland. Oh yeah, just a collection of stories that I can pick up and put down as I please. I've read at least one other book like this before and I enjoyed it, but the only thing is this was published in like 2007, so some of the information in here is 
would be outdated by now. Yeah, 2007. So that was the one thing that I found with the other book that I read that was a collection of travel writings was that it was an impression of that place at a specific time and now it's been 10-15 years since that person was there so it could be a bit different so you kind of have to think about it as something in that place and time. This is one of the newer books on this TBR, Sex and the Single Woman, 24 Writers Reimagine Helen Gurley Brown's cult classic edited by Eliza Smith and Haley Swanson. This is a reimagining of Sex and the Single Girl, which was published in the 60s and was very groundbreaking at the time. The author wrote about many different things related to being a woman in that time period, but there were certain things that she wasn't even allowed to talk about at that time because her publisher refused to publish the book if she put certain content in it. So this is addressing some of those things that Helen Gurley Brown couldn't talk about in her original book and then it also expands and talks about society now and some of the updates. So there's like IVF is in here, uh, polyamory, uh, interracial dating, trans womanhood. So there's a lot of interesting things in here. So this was yeah, sent to me by the publisher and I am excited to see what these different writers have to say. This is one of my newest hauls. It is The Pink Line, Journeys Across the World's Queer Frontiers by Mark Gavisser. Mark is a South African author, and this book is looking at queer history, but also queer lives in different places around the world that aren't US and UK centric, which I am looking forward to. I feel like most of the books that I pick up related to queer culture that I hear about are books that take place in Canada, but especially the US and the UK. This one is actually, it's like one of those books where the pages are really thin, so it's longer than it looks, but I'm really excited about it. Fight of the Century. Writers reflect on 100 years of landmark ACLU cases. This is edited by Michael Shabon and Eilat Waldman. They are husband and wife, I believe. And uh, they, yeah, edited this collection of many different writers, people who I've heard of and not heard of, reflecting on landmark cases like Roe v. Wade, Brown v. Board of Education, and then many others that I haven't heard of. I just thought this was a very creative way to be able to learn about U.S. history. I then have Code Girls, The Untold Story of American Women Code Breakers of World War II by Liza Mundy. This is a fun find, in my opinion. I'd seen this book around, but I'd never actually, you know, grabbed it or felt like the overwhelming urge, and then I found it at a library book sale, and of course, for like three dollars, two or three dollars. Sure, yeah. This is pretty self-explanatory based on the subtitle there, but yeah, I'm gonna dive into what all these women were doing while the men were off on you know, the front lines. And this is women from like all different backgrounds. People from like Ivy League schools to, you know, small communities. And they're all coming together to do this work and break these codes. So it could be really cool. One Person, No Vote, How Voter Suppression is Destroying Our Democracy by Carol Anderson. This was long listed for the National Book Award. This is one that has been, had been on my radar for a long time and I only more recently acquired it. And I feel like this is something that is relevant all the time, is especially relevant during years where we have large elections in the US, but I just wanna get a deeper dive into that subject. I also have Bury My Heart and Wounded Knee, an Indian history of the American West by Dee Brown. This is, a pretty famous book. Yeah, I'm just gonna get more of a history of, as it's stated here, an Indian history, but like an indigenous history of the US. And there is sort of a follow-up book to this that was more recently published that covers things since this book has come out, since it was so long ago. So if I really like this, I'll definitely try that other one too. I also have Cleopatra, A Life by Stacey Schiff. This is one that I had seen around and then I, yeah, saw it like a thrift store or something. And I was like, I'm kind of inter I'm kind of interested in checking that out. And then I reread the Royal Diaries series book about Cleopatra, which is, you know, maybe like a quarter of the length of this. But it gave me some really helpful background on Cleopatra because I 
definitely like ancient history is not my forte and so reading that book I was be I was able to make some connections and draw some lines and remember some things that I would just never be able to recall and it did motivate me to read this book more did I pick it up now but it's still here because I am still interested in reading it I feel like this would be great for me to just like bump up my ancient history knowledge this is another older entry on the TBR shelf kind of in that middle range. This is Bill Bryson's The Life and Times of the Thunderbolt Kid. It is a memoir about him growing up in the 50s in the US. And this is one I did debate getting rid of it at one point, but I read the first couple pages and I was interested in it. Bill Bryson and me don't really get along anymore. I really liked his stuff when I was sort of it, like early university, like 10 years ago. <laughs> I was I was into his stuff and then I just felt like he was getting like grouchier and grouchier and some stuff that I've read of his it just it I find it almost offensive what he says but this is him talking about himself and I just I liked the tone of what I got in those first couple pages so I am still holding on to this one. I also have The Spy and the Traitor, The Greatest Espionage Story of the Cold War by Ben McIntyre. Ben McIntyre is sort of known for writing these sorts of nonfiction books and I've heard really good things about this one. This is about, yeah, Cold War, KGB stuff and I just feel like it could be really intense and probably surprising to learn some of that stuff. Like this is before I was alive when this is this stuff is happening. But it's kind of crazy sometimes to learn like what they were actually doing at that point in time. And then also to think like what's happening now that we aren't aware of but might be aware of in like 30 years. I then have some of my thicker books, my bigger books. I have These Truths by Jill Lepore. Uh, this is a history of the United States. It is massive and I am still very interested in reading it because it looks at US history but in the context of these truths, which is like we find these truths to be self-evident, that like all men are created equal, that sort of thing. Um, but it's like looking at political equity, natural rights, sovereignty of the people, and did this nation, the US in this case, and democracy itself deliver on those promises? My answer is probably not for everybody. So I yeah, I am, I've seen some people talk about this book and I have heard good things and I just like, it's floppy too. It's so big and floppy. So when I do read it, it's going to be so satisfying. I just, I have a really hard time picking up really thick books because I know it's going to take me forever to read them. But there is that part of me that still gets really excited at the prospect of making my way through something so chunky. I also have this very heavy book, The 40s, The Story of a Decade by The New Yorker. This is just a combination of many stories that ran in the New Yorker during the 40s and they're sort of categorized based on what they're looking at. So we have like the war, World War II obviously, we have American scenes, post-war character studies, critic stuff about like books and things that were coming out then. I actually got this book from my library and I just to kind of check it out and see if I was interested in it and I was reading bits of it but the person who'd had it before me or a couple people before me was clearly a smoker because it just reeked of cigarette smoke. So I returned the book way faster than I would have normally, but then that kind of pushed me to get my own copy. This does contain Hiroshima, which is one of the most famous New Yorker pieces to ever be published. I believe when it was published, it was the entire issue of the New Yorker because it's so long. That is in here. That's part of the reason or a big reason why I wanted to pick this up in the first place. So I would really like to get to that. There's just a lot of other things in here too. I have Furiously Happy, a funny book about horrible things by Jenny Lawson on my shelves. This was a thrift store find and I'd heard a lot of people talking about it and I'm not usually like a comedy humor book kind of person, but because this is a memoir and it's talking about some pretty intense things just with more of a humorous spin on it, I thought it was worth a try. I've seen people who've really enjoyed it, people who have really haven't. Um, I don't even necessarily feel the urge to actually read the physical copy, so maybe I'll end up like listening to it on audio, but it does seem to be, like flipping through it, it does seem to be kind of edited a certain way to, you can't really see that, it does seem to be edited a certain way to kind of enhance the experience, so I don't know. 
this is one I'm not like super enthused about, but I am, I still have that bit of a drive to pick it up. An Imperfect Offering, Humanitarian Action in the 21st Century by James Orbinski. This is, it kind of feels more academic, just like the look and the title of it. Uh, but this was one that I've seen in the thrift stores a bunch and I finally was like, okay, okay, I'll get it, I'll get it. Because it talks about uh, this doctor, James Orbinski, helping to form the uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, which is Doctors Without Borders. And he's going into all of these like war-torn, destroyed areas and helping people, like helping them get better. And I really enjoy medical nonfiction. So I was like, okay, this is kind of mixing two things that I enjoy, medical nonfiction and people dealing with very intense situations. So I was finally like, okay, I'm just, I'm gonna pick it up. I'm gonna try it out. Three Women by Lisa Tadeo. This book was everywhere a couple of years ago. And I spotted it in a thrift store and was like, you are coming home with me because everybody's been talking about this book and I really want to check it out. Clearly have not actually picked it up at this point. Am still interested in seeing how it actually goes. It was one of those books where everybody was loving it and then it reached a wider audience and there started to be some people saying that it wasn't very good. So I'm curious to see where I fall on that scale. This book follows three different women and their sex lives, which is a very particular thing to write about. And I think that's why it grabbed so many people's attention. But yeah, very curious to see how I feel about this one. This one is very specific. It is Witness to Revolution, The Advocate Reports on Gay and Lesbian Politics from 1967 to 1999, edited by Chris Bull. So this is just a collection of articles that ran in The Advocate, which is a publication, and it will be a nice glimpse into queer history. It's just one of those things you have to be in the right mood to read it. Uh, but it is floppy, so that's nice. All right, folks, we are definitely more than halfway through. I have, of my original five stacks, I have two left, so we're getting there. Untapped, The Scramble for Africa's Oil by John Gisvinian. I have had this on my shelves since 2017, I believe. I remember where I was when I picked it up. And this is, yeah, talking about the scramble for Africa's oil and how it impacted the people that live in these various countries. Uh, not going to be a particularly happy book, but I know I would learn a lot because I really don't know anything about this particular subject. The New Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Colorblindness by Michelle Alexander. This is my sister's book, so I'm technically borrowing it from her, is going to go back to her at some point. This one has uh, been all over the place, especially after George Floyd's murder. This was one of those books that a lot of people were uh, sharing, talking about and encouraging other people to read. I uh, was aware of it, I think, before that, but I'd never like really gravitated towards picking it up. But then my sister had a copy and I was like, can I borrow that? Of course she said yes. So yes, learning all of the horrible details about mass incarceration, and I believe this is like specifically focused on the US. It's not gonna like delve too much into any other places, but yeah, this is the 10th anniversary edition. So yeah, this book's existed for a while. This is one of the big ones again. I have And the Band Played on Politics, People, and the AIDS Epidemic by Randy Schultz. I, if you notice, started this at one point. I got 88 pages in, and I was also reading another book about the AIDS epidemic at the time, and it was it was just too much. I couldn't do both. This They're both very large, and the other one was a bit more appealing to me because it was um, more, it was like the full story all the way up to much more present day, whereas this one, it ends in it very specifically before things are fully resolved because Randy Schultz passed away from complications of HIV AIDS. This is the book though that people know in regards to the AIDS epidemic. So I do want to pick it back up and keep reading at some point in the future. I just, I know that that's not right now. I have Ace, What Asexuality Reveals About Desire, Society, and the Meaning of Sex by Angela Chen. This is actually on my list of 10 books that I wanna read in 2023. I feel like there's been a lot more talk, a lot more discourse, I guess, about people who are ace and like what that spectrum looks like. And so I really wanted to read some work by written by somebody who identifies as ace. I have Black Faces, White Spaces, Reimagining the Relationship of African Americans to the Great Outdoors by Carolyn Finney. This is a book that Les gave me. It's published by the University of North Carolina Press, but it's talking about a subject that 
I see a lot because I do like to hang out in internet spaces that talk about like hiking and just doing outdoorsy things and you know sometimes the discussion that's on there is about how there's really a lack of people of color who are out enjoying nature and so this is going to deep dive into that but like with specifically the relationship between the great outdoors and African Americans so yeah gonna learn some more on this. I then have some more Canadian nonfiction, The Skin We Are In, A Year of Black Resistance and Power by Desmond Cole. This is written by a Canadian author uh, taking place in the year 2017 and looking at black people living in Canada at that time and what has and has not changed. Since this country was founded, 2017 was an important year for Canada because we celebrated 150 years of existing as a country. So you've got that exciting, yay, 150 years of Canada existing, but then you're also juxtaposing it with how black people are being treated in that year as well. Another big floppy one, Blood in the Water, The Attica Prison Uprising of 1971 and Its Legacy by Heather Ann Thompson. This is a winner of the Pulitzer Prize. That's not necessarily why I picked it up. I think Rincey or Rincey Reeves was talking about this and that's what got me to pick it up. And it is looking at the Attica prison uprising, which is something I am very vaguely aware of. It's, I feel like it's one of those things that gets referenced all of the time, but I don't know the intricacies of the event. And then it's going to look at how that influenced things from the moment that it occurred up until now. And this is going to be a deep, deep dive. And then I have another one in a similar vein. I have From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, The Making of Mass Incarceration in America by Elizabeth Hinton. This is another university press, yeah, Harvard University Press, so probably a bit more academic, but something that I, I has always interested me to some degree. You hear a lot of uh, people talking about like how the war on drugs was really not a success and how that has influenced so much of like the mass incarceration issue that we have today. Uh, so this is gonna break that down a bit more for me. This one is, I guess it's sort of fiction, but it's also nonfiction. It's got this interesting combo, protest stories of resistance. It's featuring a number of different authors and it's as edited by Raw Page. This looks at a bunch of different protests that have happened over the years, starting with the British uh, Peasants' Revolt of 1381 to the anti-Iraq War demonstration of 2003. So you're like learning about those things, but then you're also reading from the from the perspective in like a historical fiction story. Like after you learn a bit about the event, then the author sort of dives deeper and gives you what it might have been like to be there at that time. So. Those specific stories are fiction, but all of the information surrounding it and the other stuff that you learn is nonfiction. So yeah, this one sort of like toes the line between the two. So I did include it in nonfiction, but you would probably argue that it would be fiction as well. Atlantic, great sea battles, heroic discoveries, titanic storms, and a vast ocean of a million stories by Simon Winchester. This is a book that I still need to read for the Shelf Sisters series. This is the third book that Les picked for me to read. So this one will hopefully get read in 2023. That's the goal. And this is just a deep dive at The Atlantic. Simon Winchester is a very famous nonfiction writer. I've never read anything by him before that I can recall. So this would be, you know, my first introduction to him. You're gonna learn a lot of things about the Atlantic Ocean. And yeah, I feel like that could be pretty cool. This is one I've had for a while. This is Walter Bonatti, The Mountains of My Life. Uh, Walter Bonatti is a climber, like a mountaineer, and this is him reflecting on his time being a mountaineer and sort of what it was like back in the day to do that and the different equipment that they had and how, not that mountaineering isn't extreme now, but think about how extreme it was in the 50s. Like you just don't have the technology that we do now. I actually tried to read this at one point and I just wasn't in the mood for it, but it seems like the different chapters are talking about different ascents that he did and the year that he did them. So like I'm looking at stuff that happened in the 40s, like late 40s into the 50s. So could be really cool, just might have to be in the right headspace for it. This is one that has been on my TBR a really long time. I included it in a video where I read the like a try a chapter video and I was trying to see if I wanted to unhaul it, but I was still interested in reading it. That is God is Not Great, How Religion Poisons Everything by Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so not not like 
controversial necessarily, but I feel like if, you know, if I were to post a review about this book, depending on what sort of angle I looked at it from, you could get some uh, arguments and debates going in the comments if you wanted. And so yeah, I was still interested in diving into this and seeing what he has to say based on the chapter and a little bit that I did read. Yeah, this one has been on my shelf so long that the the spine is like a completely different shade of yellow. Another yellow one, The Birth of the Pill, How Four Crusaders Reinvented Sex and Launched a Revolution by Jonathan Aig. This is one that I tried to read a number of years ago and I just wasn't into it. So I also included it in a try it chapter and I was like, oh damn, this is actually really good. So it was clear that when I had first picked it up, I just was not in the right mindset for it. So I am still very interested in reading this now that I've sort of refreshed my enthusiasm for it. The pill is a huge thing and the fact that it didn't exist at one point makes sense but it's also like damn you know. So this is going to dive into that and probably make me a bit upset but also very very grateful, very thankful. I then have The Art Detective Adventures of an Antiques Roadshow Appraiser by Philip Mould. I was someone that grew up watching Antiques Roadshow with my family. I remember it being on in the background all the time and it is a very cool show. So that's, yeah, there's a little bit of nostalgia wrapped up in this for me. Uh, Philip is a appraiser for paintings specifically, that's where his knowledge is, and each chapter of this is focusing on a different painting. And so, yeah, learn a little bit of art history, maybe get some behind the scenes stuff about Antiques Roadshow. I thought it could be really cool. Second to last, I have another very famous nonfiction book that is The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks by Rebecca Skloot. Uh, this was recently made into an HBO film as well, so it was already kind of popular and then it got really buzzy again when the film came out, so I feel like I could do a book to movie comparison with this. This is also medical nonfiction, and so it's one of those things like, why haven't I read this yet? I've heard so many people talk about it. Multiple people in my family have read it. Les has now read it, so like, it's time. I gotta pick this up, learn about Henrietta Lacks, what they did with her cells, and like the reparations that her family really deserves. My very last book is The Inconvenient Indian, A Curious Account of Native People in North America by Thomas King. This is a Canadian author, but I think he's also lived in the US, could be a dual citizen for all I know. And uh, yeah, so writing about indigenous people in North America and the history of it from sort of a different perspective. Uh, this is one I've seen everywhere for a really long time and figured it could really help bolster my knowledge, as all of these nonfiction books can do. I feel like I love nonfiction because I can just learn so much from it and I love the potential that's there. So yeah, that hopefully gives you a bit of a perspective on what sort of nonfiction books I like. All of these are potential reads, so let me know which ones I should maybe prioritize, which ones have you read, did you like them, did you not like them? You can let me know in the comments below. Kudos to you if you made it to the end of this video. If you want to find us elsewhere on the internet, some links are in the down bar. Thank you all very much for watching, and I'll see you later.